It's so great to see some familiar faces. I see a hi, Abhijah. Yeah, so we are live now. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this special lecture by Professor Tejasu Niganti. I am Ishan Sharma, founder of Carvan, and I am so delighted to have her because I am a fan of Bollywood, as most of the Indians and now in the West as well. And today she is going to talk about the evolution of state policy towards the Hindi cinema. Professor Ganti is associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and core faculty in its program in culture and media at New York University, a cultural and visual anthropologist specializing in South Asia. She is uh, majorly uh, interested in anthropology of uh, media, Indian cinema, media industries, production culture, visual culture, and globalization. She has been conducting research about the social world and filmmaking practices of the Hindi cinema for, uh, for quite some time since 1996. She was also the assistant director in uh, Dilto Pagal, I think, if, if, if I have taken that correctly. For a brief, and, for a brief bit, yeah. Yeah, so she was involved in the assistant directorship of Dilto Pagal, a movie I think most of you have seen. And she's the author of Producing Bollywood Inside the Contemporary Hindi Film Industry and Bollywood, a guidebook to popular Hindi cinema. And she's also been involved in some dubbing of popular web series, including Sacred Games, so without further ado, I would request ma'am to continue with the lecture and we take some questions from the audience who are watching us live on Facebook and who are, uh, who are on Zoom with us. So people can use raise hand option on Zoom to interact with ma'am after the lecture or they can write it in the chat, uh, the, their questions and we'll take them. So over to you ma'am and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. All right, thank you. Um, actually, and Ishan, thank you so much for the invitation to speak. I'm really excited to be here. Good evening, everybody who are in India, and good morning for those of us, those of you who've joined me here in the US. Um, I'm really excited to be here, I'm really excited to see some familiar faces and names. And I want to say, I think Karavan's initiative is terrific to make Indian history more accessible and point out its relevance for our times. And to everyone watching and listening, I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy during this pandemic. Today, I'll be talking about the history of the Indian government's relationship to the Hindi film industry. Um, it's a very tumultuous relationship. It's marked by a great deal of ambivalence. And first to make sure everyone is aware of the basic history of filmmaking in India, um, I just wanna remind us that the history of cinema in India goes back to the end of the 19th century when the first films were screened in Bombay in 1896. The first Indian feature film, Raja Harishchandra, was released in 1913. And the first sound film, which was in Hindi, Alamara, was released in 1931. Now, within a decade of the advent of sound, the ratio of foreign films being screened in India dropped to less than 10%. And the film industries in India grew at a rapid rate without import barriers or state supports. It was also the only large-scale film industry to develop under colonial rule. Even before independence in 1947, India was the world's third largest producer of films and filmmaking was the eighth largest industrial activity in India. And after independence, India was the second largest producer of films following the United States. And since 1971, India has been the world's largest producer of films making somewhere between 650 to 1000 films a year in about 20 languages. So since the 1970s, India has been exporting films to about a hundred countries yearly and was the only quote third world nation among the world's major film exporters. Now, despite you know, this type of scale and the popularity of mainstream cinema, for more than 50 years, the Indian government didn't regard filmmaking as an industry, nor did it regard popular cinema as an art form. In fact, it was only in May, 1998 that filmmaking was actually recognized as an industry. So even though people and the media use the phrase Indian or Hindi or Tamil film industry, from the point of view of the government, there was really no quote film industry in an official sense. So what was cinema? For much of the history of independent India, popular cinema was regarded as a sort of vice or problem by political leaders and government officials. So today I'll be discussing the Indian government's attitudes and policies toward filmmaking and how they've changed over time 
in order to illustrate the significance of cinema in the politics of national prestige, nation building, and modernization in contemporary India. So I just want to give you a broad, broad kind of roadmap of my talk, and I'm just going to share um, just to give you a sense of what what the outline is of the of the talk. So here, first, I want to talk about um, how the medium of cinema right was viewed during the anti colonial struggles by national leaders like Gandhi and Nehru. Then I'll look at um, I'll be talking about how cinema was regarded and treated in the first 50 years of India being an independent nation, an era that's marked by an ethos and concern with development and modernization. So there's three way, main ways that cinema is thought about and talked about in this period. Um, cinema is regarded as a vice, as a cultural problem, and as a tool for development. And then finally, I'll discuss the change in attitude and policies that happened after economic liberalization in the 1990s and cinema starts to be thought of as kind of a form of national heritage and as economic enterprise. Okay. So let's, so first I want to just briefly talk about pre-independence, right? Although film production primarily has been a private enterprise, it's been an object of government regulation in India since colonial times through censorship, taxation, allocation of raw materials, and control over exhibition through the licensing of theaters. Now, while Dada Sab Falke, who made Raja Harishchandra in 1913 and has earned the title Father of Indian Cinema, he was explicitly nationalist in his motivation for making films. He wanted to create Indian images for Indian audiences and wanted to establish a completely indigenous or Swadeshi industry. The leaders of the Indian National Congress, which was the main organization fighting British rule, didn't think cinema was important. Most leaders at that time viewed the cinema as, quote, low or vulgar entertainment popular with the uneducated masses. Now, one of the reasons that the INC did not regard film as an important tool in its mobilizing and organizing efforts had to do with Gandhiji's distaste towards cinema, which probably stemmed from it being, quote, a foreign technology. Gandhi declared many times that he had never seen a single film and compared cinema with other vices, such as sakta, gambling, and horse racing. When the Indian Cinematograph Committee was conducting its exhaustive study of filmmaking and film viewing in India in 1927, it sent a questionnaire to Gandhi asking him his views about the state of cinema in India. Gandhi returned the questionnaire to the committee with the letter stating that he had no views about the quote, sinful technology. So his letter dated November 12th, 1927. I'm gonna show you so that you can see. Okay, right, so because even if I was so minded, I should be unfit to answer your questionnaire as I have never been to a cinema, but even to an outsider, the evil it has done and is doing is patent. The good, if it has done at all, remains to be proved, end quote, right? So this is Gandhi's um, attitude towards cinema. Now, I just want to do a brief detour here, which to, in order to kind of help contextualize Gandhi's and other people's attitudes towards cinema and filmmaking at that time. Remember that until the 1930s, when films started to be made in sound, the majority of films being screened in India during the silent era were American films. And although the history of cinema in India has usually been viewed and written through a specific nationalist lens, the emergence of motion pictures occurs in a specific global moment, right? So the quote, birth and dissemination of cinema takes place in a global economy that's characterized by colonial powers and their colonies. And Bombay's development into the center of film production in India is integrally connected to its history as a colonial city and based on its position as the main center of commerce and manufacturing in British India. The economic base of Bombay allowed for film technology to take root and flourish as capital from other industri industrial and commercial activity flowed into filmmaking. So when you do start to have local filmmaking take off in Bombay, the industry was marked by a high level of ethnic, religious, linguistic, and regional diversity in terms of its members. We always think of the current Hindi film industry as really cosmopolitan and diverse, 
but it was like that in the 1930s as well. In fact, even perhaps even more so, not only were members of the Bombay film industry from, were they from every region in South Asia, but they were also from Europe and Australia as well. In fact, one of the prominent studios of the 1930s, Bombay Talkies, had Germans working in key positions, including as directors, right? And so some iconic Hindi films, uh, like Achut Kanya, were actually directed by a German, right? And one of the top stars, right? So, and one of the top stars of the early 1930s was Fearless Nadia, the screen name of Mary Evans, who was an Australian born woman of mixed Welsh Greek parentage settled in India, right? Here is, so here's an example of, I mean, this is a silent film, but this is an example, you know, Franz Austin, who was working in Bombay Talkies, the German director. Here is an example of Fearless Nadia. Um, she was really one of the most popular stars of the 1930s. And in addition to incorporating um, personnel from different parts of the world, the Bombay industry also played a role in establishing other cinematic traditions as well. For example, a piece of Iranian film history is traced back to Bombay since Adeshar Irani, who made the first Hindi film, Alamara, he also produced the first Farsi language film made for the Iranian market. So there's another still of Fearless Nadia. Stop share. So my point is um, that the Bombay film industry has always been global in its orientation and been filled with people who defy easy categorization. And nationalist and nationalism, right? So nationalism and nationalist movements are always about trying to fit people into narrowly defined categories, right? So nationalism is all about creating boundaries, whereas, uh, in, whereas a place, space like the Bombay film industry has always been about crossing those boundaries. Now, unlike Gandhi, Nehru was not averse to the cinema, but was critical of the kind of films being made at the time. So in a message to the Indian Motion Picture Congress held in Bombay in 1939, Nehru stated, and let me share that slide again. Um, right? So Nehru stated, quote, I'm far from satisfied at the quality of work that has been done. Motion pictures have become an essential part of modern life and they could be used with great advantage for educational purposes. So far, greater stress has been laid on a type of film which presumably is supposed to be entertaining, but the standard or quality of which is not high. I hope that the industry will consider now in terms of meeting the standards and of aiming at producing high class films which have educational and social values. Such films should receive the help and cooperation of not only the public, but also of the state, end quote. And I'm trying to stop, okay. So here one sees how entertainment is synonymous with poor quality and low standards. And the significance of film as a medium is described in terms of its pedagogical potential, right? Its ability to teach people. Now, both Gandhi's view of cinema as corrupting and Nehru's view of film as a tool for modernization crucially shaped government policy and official attitudes towards cinema in independent India. During Nehru's tenure as prime minister, a number of institutions and policies were established to promote, quote, high-class filmmaking. While the Nehruvian perspective on cinema has been the dominant one, noticeably in the creation and maintenance of a cultural and cinematic bureaucracy, to counter commercial cinema, Gandhi's moralism and view of cinema as corrupting also lingered in policies such as censorship and taxation. So now I want to turn to talking about uh, really the kind of big chunk of time after independence, right? So for about the first 50 years of independence and the kind of the role of the state, the role of the cinema and kind of government policies and attitudes about it. Now, unlike the US government, which from the early part of the 20th century treated filmmaking as a business and helped Hollywood to distribute its films globally. The Indian government didn't think filmmaking was economically significant, even though shortly after independence, India became the second largest film producing country in the world. Despite filmmaking being the second largest quote industry in India in terms of capital investment and the fifth largest in the number of people employed, 
the economic ideology of a newly independent India constructed a hierarchy of needs in which filmmaking wasn't considered an essential or important sphere of economic activity. Entertainment wasn't viewed as a necessity in a country that at the time of independence was 18% literate, had an average life expectancy of 26 years, was suffering from a food crisis, and had over a million refugees to resettle. Instead, rapid industrialization, infrastructural development, and food self-sufficiency were the main priorities of national economic policy. So in this, in this era, basically, you see that cinema was regarded as a vice, a cultural problem, or a tool for development. Right? So first, the first point about cinema as a vice. Now, certain policies imposed immediately after independence had long-lasting repercussions for filmmaking. For example, there was a moratorium on non-essential building due to the shortage of cement and building materials, which meant that most states imposed a ban on theater construction. As a result, till this day, India has an extremely low number of movie screens. Currently, there are only about 8,600 screens. Um, in fact, despite being the world's largest film producing country, India has one of the lowest ratio of screens to population. The last time I checked the statistic, it was about 12 screens per 1 million people, while the US has like 117 screens per million people. Most state governments also stipulated that movie theaters could not be constructed near schools, colleges, places of worship, residential areas, and government offices. Economic policies treated cinema as a source of tax revenue rather than as an engine of growth. So taxes levied on cinema were akin to those levied on vices, such as gambling and horse racing. The main bulk of taxation was collected by individual state governments through the entertainment tax, which was a sales tax ranging in rates from 20 to 75% imposed on box office receipts. Now, while the British colonial government instituted the entertainment tax in 1922, it was continued and augmented by other forms of taxation in independent India. Most state governments increased entertainment tax rates soon after independence. For instance, the tax rate was 12.5% before World War II in most provinces with temporary wartime increases. But by 1949, rates ranged from 25 to 75% across the country with an average of 33.5%. Municipalities also began to levy entertainment taxes as well as duties on the transport of films from one place to another. Producers sending films out of the country discovered that they had to pay an exorbitant import duty to the Indian government on their own film prints in order to bring them back into the country, right? So their, their own films were being treated as an import and they had to pay customs on it, customs duties on it. Additionally, there were sales taxes, other import duties, internal customs duties, income taxes, show taxes, and charges for censorship. By mid-1949, film industry organizations estimated that 60% of all box office revenues were being taken by the state in the form of taxes. While state policies of taxation and licensing accorded films the status of a vice, state cultural policies treated mainstream films as a threat to other art forms. As I mentioned earlier, as a British colony, India was the world's third largest producer of films. So from the point of view of the national leadership after independence, filmmaking was seen as having escaped the effects of colonialism, unlike other artistic and performance traditions that had suffered greatly. In fact, the popularity of films and their music was viewed as a threat to novelists, painters, classical singers and dancers and folk performers. A myriad of ministries, academies, and institutes were established shortly after independence, dealing with the visual performing and literary arts, like the Sangeet Natak, Lalit Kala, and Sahitya Academies. The Indian government, in an effort to revive and support the traditional arts and high culture, excluded cinema from these categories and placed it under the purview of the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, rather than the Ministry of Cultural Affairs. This cultural bureaucracy consistently viewed cinema as a problem, warranting the attention of a number of government commissions, inquiries, and symposia in independent India. So some examples of what I mean by this is cinema as a problem, right, all of these ways. So here you see there is the 1951 Film Inquiry Committee, the Sangeet Natak Academy Film 
Seminar of 1955, the COSA Committee on Film Censorship in 1968, the Symposium on Cinema in Developing Countries in 1979, the Working Group on National Film Policy, oops, National Film Policy, sorry, um, in 1980, and the National Conference on Challenges Before Indian Cinema in 1998. Right, so you can see that there is just a constant kind of plethora of of commissions and conferences and reports to kind of think about how to basically solve the problem. And the main problem of cinema from the point of view of the government was that, you know, India makes lots of films, but they're not very good films. Like, so how to make, how to, you know, how to have people make better films was basically the kind of attitude that all of these um, various commissions and events were focusing on. So this cultural bureaucracy consistently viewed, right, as I said, a cinema as a problem. Um, and in such inquiries, filmmakers time and again singled out state policies as the source of problems besetting filmmaking, right? So when the government, when leader, political leaders were saying to filmmakers, you make really bad films and you need to do a better job of making these, you know, making films, filmmakers would say, well, it's actually, you know, the problem that we face is all of the various government policies like taxation, for example, right? So filmmakers blamed the government for the kind of filmmaking that they were able to make while government blamed filmmakers for the kind of filmmaking they're making, right? So, and the bureau, and so bureaucrats and state leaders laid the blame on less material and more intangible factors such as audience taste, right? So often um, there was a, a lot of lamenting in some of these reports about like, well, you know, why do our audiences like the kinds of films that they do? Is there a way to kind of somehow improve audience taste? Now in an attempt to foster quote, good cinema and counter the dominant mode of filmmaking as represented by the Hindi film industry, the government established the Film Finance Corporation in 1960, which later became the National Film Development Corporation or NFDC in 1980. Now these state institutions were responsible for financing films of quote, high artistic content and quote, serious filmmakers who were defined primarily by their rejection of the aesthetic, generic and production conventions of popular cinema and then became known as the new Indian cinema. Films falling under, the, falling under this category also referred to as parallel or art cinema were characterized by their social realistic aesthetic, smaller budgets, location shooting, absence of song and dance sequences, lesser known actors, although you can say there's a whole star system that developed within the parallel cinema as well, and a naturalistic style of acting as opposed to the big budgets, elaborate sets, songs, superstars, and melodramatics of mainstream cinema. Now to the third point, which is about cinema as a tool for development. Films, so this is a quote, films are too important to be left to filmmakers alone. Now this statement by the director of the Indian Institute of Mass Communication made during his welcome speech at the symposium on cinema in developing countries held in Delhi in 1979, best encapsulates official attitudes toward the medium of cinema for much of India's post-independence period. Much of the discourse about film in India communicated that it was a very powerful tool that could either be used for the greater good or could be very dangerous if in the wrong hands. It then became the government's responsibility to ensure the production of films that produced positive or beneficial effects, as well as prohibit those which could be damaging. So example of the, examples of the government's prescriptive role include the system of national awards for films instituted in 1954, while its proscriptive role is primarily through the institution of film censorship carried over from the colonial period. Now, just to give a context as to why was there this type of attitude regarding cinema. I think it's, it's really a result of the high rates of illiteracy and the unparalleled popularity of films and film stars in India, the government has viewed film as a pedagogical tool in modernization agendas. So illiteracy or the lack of a formal education signaled to government leaders that vast portions of the populace who are referred to as the masses, were easily influenced or incited by on-screen images. And I wanna point out that most of the time when people talk about like people being easily influenced or 
incited by on-screen images, it's always like someone else. Like no one ever thinks they themselves are necessarily that like easily influenced, but there's always that person out there, someone else out there that is somehow easily influenced, right? And since the masses were perceived as very malleable and in need of proper molding, elected officials and bureaucrats throughout the decades have been urging filmmakers to make quote, socially relevant films to uplift the masses. The Indian government's concern with socially relevant cinema is connected to its hypodermic needle understanding of media effects and influence. Now, in this very simplistic top-down causal view of media influence, cinema and audiovisual media in general can directly influence behavior and shape attitudes and subjectivities. And meaning basically it's such a simple view. It's the idea of like, you know, like you have a needle that's like injecting you with the message. And like, so it's like, if you're getting a vaccine you're getting injected. So it's the same idea. It's like you're getting injected with a message and somehow that will, you know, change your mind about something, right? So a film is judged according to the perceived positive or negative effects its main theme may produce in viewers and thus in society. This is a pretty common view that's still out there. I don't believe this type of view. I think people and audiences are much more complicated um, than you know, the fact that like we can't just be injected with messages and then like, you know, be brainwashed in that way. But there's a way that that's, that kind of attitude is there. Um, and this is a perspective that provides a continued justification for censorship, film censorship, as well as institutions such as the Films Division, the state-funded documentary filmmaking institution. Thus, a striking characteristic of government attitudes and policy about cinema is the intense ambivalence, a complex mixture of pride, disdain, hope, and fear expressed toward films and filmmaking, which arises from the multivalent nature of the medium. Film is a product of science and technology, a mode of communication, an art form, a source of entertainment, and a commercial activity. I now want to turn to discussing the shift in attitudes toward mainstream cinema and filmmaking from being a heavily criticized maligned form of media to one which the government actually celebrates and touts as an example of India's success in the international arena. So my first point, and so this is really having to do with kind of the more recent moments like post-liberalization, right? And the first point has to do with kind of cinema being seen as a form of national heritage. Now, on July 7th, 1896, a representative of the Lumiere brothers from Paris en route to Australia screened the first motion pictures in India in Bombay's Watson's Hotel. Now, six months after its inaugural screening in Paris on December 28th, 1895. Now, this history became a cause for celebration by the Indian government's investment at both the central and regional levels in celebrating the centenary of cinema in both 1995 and 1996. The Ministry of Information and Broadcasting created a national committee for the celebration of the cinema centenary that organized a series of countrywide commemorations. Though the first screening of motion pictures in India did not take place until July 1896, the commemorations were kicked off with the 26th International Film Festival of India held in Bombay in January 1995. The NFDC also organized a temporary film museum with items from landmark Hindi films and produced a stage show, Cinema Cinema 100, in collaboration with the Hindi film industry as a tribute to a century of Indian cinema. The stage show, which was televised live nationally on Doordarshan, was a combination of speeches, tributes, song and dance performances, and edited sequences of the landmarks of Indian cinema organized chronologically into four main eras. Now, during my first stint of fieldwork about the Hindi film industry in 1996, I was able to attend the final commemorative event, which was the Indian Cinema Centenary Celebration organized by the National Film Archives in conjunction with the Department of Cultural Affairs of the Government of Maharashtra on July 7, 1996. The event was comprised of a combination of public and semi-public rituals inscribing the history of cinema in India onto the urban landscape of Bombay. The key attraction was a procession of members of the Hindi and Marathi film industry to the site of the Watson's Hotel, where the chief minister of Maharashtra unveiled a plaque affixed to the building proclaiming its historical importance. 
The plaque simply stated, quote, Lumiere Brothers Cinematograph was first screened here on July 7th, 1896 at the erstwhile Watson's Hotel, thus sowing the seed of one of the most popular of the art forms of this century, cinema in India, end quote. Now, that plaque at the time was just a simple canvas board with the lettering painted with this quote just painted on it. And I kept visiting that site over the years to see whether that plaque would ever actually become like a proper metallic thing that you would, you know, um, kind of install on the building, like you see other kinds of, um, you know, kind of signs of some kind of historical importance. Um, when I went in 2013, that plaque like was no longer there. And now we know that the Watson's Hotel itself is like falling apart. It's structurally unsound. It may get demolished. So, so much for the, you know, paying attention to that part of cinematic heritage. Um, after the parade and unveiling of the plaque, the proceeds shifted to the nearby YB Chawan Auditorium for the final ceremonies of the day, which involved inaugurations of the week-long film festival and an exhibition of photographs documenting the hundred years of Indian cinema. Various government officials made short speeches about the historic importance of the occasion and the significance of cinema in India. The Minister for Cultural Affairs at the time, Pramod Navalkar, declared, quote, this is an industry where there are no divisions based on caste, language, religion, or region, end quote. The director of the National Film Archive, Suresh Chabria, asserted, quote, it is really the public of India that has taken cinema to their hearts and minds. Nowhere in the world has a public taken to cinema as much as has the public of India. It is really them we have to thank, end quote. Now, what I found really striking about these rituals of commemoration was the extent of government involvement. While the government had been involved in regulation, documentation, disciplining, and discussion of filmmaking since colonial times, its role in commemoration and celebration, other than the annual ritual of national awards begun in 1954, had been minimal. Various filmmaking organizations, such as the Film Federation of India and the Indian Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, held events and produced publications commemorating the 25th and 50th anniversaries of Indian sound films in 1956 and 1981, respectively. These earlier commemorations were initiated and organized by filmmakers, with bureaucrats and government officials providing felicitations and commentary, while the centenary ce celebrations were initiated and organized by state institutions, with filmmakers playing a small role. Whereas the earlier political leaders urged the Bombay film industry to create, quote, socially relevant films to uplift the masses, statements from the various events and texts associated with the centennial commemorations were light on the criticism of popular cinema. Instead, they detailed the prolific nature of film production in India, emphasizing India's lead over the rest of the world, reiterated that the history of cinema in India was as old as the history of the medium itself, and asserted the popularity of domestic films within India. So the centenary commemorations demonstrated the transformed symbolic significance accorded to the institution of cinema by the government in India at both the national and regional levels by the mid 1990s. So why the shift? What led to this change in attitude? I would attribute it to the changes in the media landscape brought on by economic liberalization. After the advent of satellite television in 1992, dubbed by the press and some commentators as, quote, an invasion, the mass media was at the center of public debates, controversies, and anxiety around questions of nationhood, cultural sovereignty, authenticity, tradition, and identity in India. During this period, the state's policy rhetoric regarding media was focused more on safeguarding national sovereignty and, quote, Indian values, rather than uplifting the masses. In addition to satellite television, the other noticeable feature of the transformed media landscape was the increased presence of Hollywood films, both in their original English and dubbed versions. With the appearance of American content on television and in theaters, Hindi films took on the value of cultural authenticity and Indianness vis-a-vis -vis Hollywood films. However, it wasn't simply in their identity as indigenously produced films, but also in their very objectified and elaborated representations of Indianness that films from the mid-1990s operated as signs of the nation. 
the films from the mid-1990s were very concerned with issues of family, ritual, cultural authenticity, and could operate as symbols of the nation in a way that was not antithetical or opposed to official ideologies. So now turning to this uh, last point about cinema as economic enterprise. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, filmmaking wasn't officially recognized as an industry until 1998. Now, this declaration of industry status took place on May 10th, 1998, at a conference called National Conference on Challenges Before Indian Cinema, organized by FICI and, F and the Film Federation of India. While the then Minister of Information and Broadcasting, Sushma Swaraj, promised that the quote modalities be worked out soon, would be worked out soon, the more concrete assertion of industry status didn't occur until October 19th, 2000, when filmmaking or the quote entertainment industry was recognized as a quote, approved activity under industrial concerns, according to the Industrial Development Bank of India Act of 1964. Now, being designated an industry communicates that filmmaking is part of the organized industrial sector. It was this recognition that paved the way for financing from banks and other financial institutions. Since prior to this announcement, banks chose not to extend loans for filmmaking due to its very high risk nature. Now, Govind Nihlani, who's a very long-standing and critically acclaimed director, explained to me the impact of industry status. And I quote, it created a confidence among the financing community that after all, this is not such a speculative business, that it's possible to treat this industry as a proper business and if controlled well, and here it's very simple, you control your budget, bring in the right inputs, and then it's a viable industry, end quote. So since 2000, industry status introduced a greater variety of financing within the industry. Both the banking and corporate sectors began to invest in filmmaking either by providing loans or by creating production companies. Some of the largest Indian, Indian industrial houses and corporations created media subsidiaries that entered into television and film production. Another source of finance was the stock market. And some film production companies and exhibition companies became public limited companies and their stock listed and traded on the Bombay Stock Exchange. Also, the, there was the growing importance of private equity funds and venture capitalists as investors in filmmaking. Now, industry status by the central government also set the tone for state governments to rethink their policies toward filmmaking. Though entertainment tax was still a source of contention between filmmakers and the government, some states offered tax breaks for films shot in their territories. Other states enabled the boom in multiplex construction all across India by offering tax holidays to exhibitors and real estate developers. Of course, now with since the passage of the GST, there's actually no longer entertainment tax. So rather than perceiving it as a vice or as a problem as it had in the past, the Indian, the Indian state since 2000 perceives commercial filmmaking as a viable, important and legitimate economic activity that should be nurtured and supported. Government agencies in partnership with film trade organizations try to promote the export of Indian films at markets held at major film festivals, such as Cannes. Regulations regarding foreign investment within the media sector have been relaxed so that up to 100% foreign direct investment is allowed in any aspect of filmmaking, financing, production, distribution, exhibition, or marketing. At various international forum, government officials court foreign investments by, repre by representing entertainment media as a high growth industry in India. For example, at the World Economic Forum held in Davos, Switzerland in 2006, the India Brand Equity Foundation, a public private partnership between the Ministry of Commerce and Industry and the Confederation of Indian Industry distributed a report called Entertainment and Media, which provided an overview of the various media forms and their economic potential in India. After stating, quote, India today is a major emerging global market, the report asserts, quote, the Indian entertainment and media industry has outperformed the Indian economy and is one of the fastest growing sectors in India, end quote. The report concludes, quote, with a host of factors contributing to the double digit growth of the industry and an added easing of the foreign investment norms the ENM industry in India thus is a sunrise opportunity that presents significant avenues for investment, end quote. So to fully comprehend the dramatic shift in attitudes towards cinema from a tool for social change 
to an engine of economic growth, it's illustrative to compare the following two statements made by state officials separated by a span of 20 years. So the first um, statement that I'm going to show you is um, by A.M. Antule, who is the Chief Minister of Maharashtra. And this was a statement that he made uh, during the 50th anniversary. It was in the program. It's like kind of reprinted in the kind of souvenir for the 50th anniversary of Indian sound films, right? So um, here we see the film being the most effective medium of communication, its potential besides providing wholesome entertainment to the masses lies in its tremendous capacity to create social consciousness among the people about all evils and thus this must be harnessed to the maximum benefit of society at large. I'm glad that the film industry as a whole is helping every national cause in its own way, right? So this is in 1981. And the next statement is by Arun Jaitley, who's the Minister of Information and Broadcasting. And this statement was made in 2000. In, um, and here we go. He says, the entertainment industry along with the IT industry have become the buzzwords globally. It is being widely recognized and accepted that together, these two sectors will increasingly dominate the world economic landscape. Recognizing the importance of this industry, the budget for this year has given major concessions to this segment, which will pave the way for its rapid growth. It is expected that taking advantage of these measures by the government, the Indian entertainment industry would take the initiative in multiplying manifold its revenues, contribution to the exchequer, employment potential and foreign exchange earnings, end quote. And this is from a document that was produced for a FICI conference. So although both ministers expect filmmakers to serve the nation, either socially or economically, Film for Antule is a medium of communication and means for social transformation, while for Jaitley, it's a vehicle for economic ascendancy. Jaitley's remarks also acknowledge that state economic policies are key for the success and growth of filmmaking, a point that filmmakers had been arguing since the 1950s, but went unheeded for decades. Along with the change in the language used to discuss cinema, from film to quote entertainment industry, from social consciousness to contribution to the exchequer, there's also been a significant change in the nature of reports and publications generated about filmmaking. For more than four decades, the various inquiry committees, symposia, and conferences were initiated by the government, mainly via the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, to study the problem of cinema, primarily as an art form and tool for development in India. Since 1998, FICI, rather than the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, has been the main organization sponsoring conferences and discussions about filmmaking in India as part of the larger category of the entertainment industry, primarily through its annual convention, FRAMES, Global Convention on the Business of, of Entertainment. Um, oh, and I realize FICI, for those of you who may not be aware, it's the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce. Um, as apparent from the title, the focus is on the commercial aspect of cinema. The film industry is analyzed with respect to its projected turnover, export earnings, and tax revenues. These reports and financial analyses of filmmaking are produced by multinational accounting consulting firms such as Arthur Anderson, PricewaterhouseCoopers, KPMG, AT Kearney, rather than the government bureaucracy. So just to kind of conclude, what I've tried to do today is to give you a sense of how after years of disapproval, disdain, criticism, and neglect, the Indian government changed its attitudes and policies toward commercial filmmaking and popular cinema. While cinema was regarded as a locus of, quote, sinful technology, okay, that's Gandhi's point, in the 1920s, by the turn of the millennium, filmmaking became a, quote, serious business, which needed to be tuned to the demands of today's competitive business economy. That's a quote from a Fiki document. The intersection of neoliberal economic rhetoric with the rise of cultural nationalist politics signified by the Bhatia Janta Party were important factors in the shifting attitudes toward filmmaking and the Hindi film industry. I don't think it's an accident that it was a BJP-led government in 1998 that granted industry status to filmmaking, since its, support is, since its support base is heavily drawn from the small business owner and entrepreneurial class 
who also comprised the vast distribution, exhibition, and finance apparatus for Hindi filmmaking. Also, the sort of Hindi films that were being made in the 1990s, emptied of all poverty and class conflict and populated with wealthy families, Hindu rituals, and elaborate weddings, presented a nostalgic vision of Indian culture and family values that frequently corresponded with or didn't pose a challenge to the BJP's own cultural rhetoric. Cinema's significance in a neoliberal economic imaginary arises from its ability to circulate in a variety of global markets, which becomes a cause for nationalist celebration. With cinema occupying an important position in the national economic imaginary, the circulation of Hindi films in places like the US, UK, or Germany represents the success of the Indian nation on the global stage. That the Hindi film industry is the only other dominant globally circulating film industry, and that Hindi films are registering equal or higher box office grosses than Hollywood films in advanced industrialized countries such as the US, Japan, or Britain are interpreted by the Indian state, Indian press, and filmmakers through a matrix of national pride and distinction. The steady stream of European, Australian, Canadian, and American representatives of tourist boards and film councils to Bombay to meet Hindi filmmakers and offer incentives to shoot in their countries with the hopes of increasing tourism from India demonstrates how filmmaking can operate as a medium for reversing the typical first world, third world economic relationship, which had defined India's status in the world system since independence. More recently, government officials have been discussing the role of cinema and the film industry as an important manifestation of India's soft power in the world. This was apparent in the most recent Fiki Frames conference that took place virtually this year. The phrase harnessing India's soft power via the media and entertainment industry was constantly being used. However, this doesn't mean that the tensions between the government and the Hindi film industry have been resolved. In fact, the way that the Hindi film industry has been under attack over the last several months, various branches of the government the line has not disappeared. The illicit behavior, the echoing earlier sentiments of cinema as a vice. On the other hand, the global success of contemporary Hindi films and the global circulation of film stars like the main issue is that for decades, governments have been trying to discipline the Hindi film industry and make it come to their vision of art, culture, or thankful when these efforts. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this wonderful lecture. It was, uh, I think, it is very important to understand the 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 power of Hindi cinema and the relation between the state and cinema that they uh, share. And you have vividly, uh, very uh, elaborately, you have defined how the state policy have been shaped from Gandhi ji view to re most recent to Modi's uh, and Jaitley's view of the Hindi cinema. And I think the only movie that Gandhiji watched was Ram Rajya. Ram Rajya yeah. And, yeah. and then now we know, I think movies are openly advertised by government and by, by political parties, if we can say. So ma'am, do you think that from Nehru and Gandhi to uh, Jaitley and Modi, do you think there's a change in, in the view of nation building cinema? Like, we had Mother India and then we have Pura Pashim uh, showing a certain national identity of India, very secular identity of India. Do you think there's a change in today's India and India of Nehru in terms of cinema? Um, well, definitely. I mean, th there's definitely been changes. Uh, let me speak to what I think, um, what I think that perhaps you're hinting at is that I think in the last are we in 2020? I would say the last five years or maybe within the last decade, there's definitely been a much more um, broader, I guess, like a much more public assertion of a certain vision of the past um, that doesn't necessarily align with how 
we have thought about our past, right? So you have much more overtly um, like Hindutva oriented narratives that are making it into uh, popular cinema uh, where history itself is being um, basically rewritten via cinema. So I'm thinking, for example, that film, uh, is it called Kesri, the one with Akshay Kumar? Yeah. Uh, right, it's Kesri, correct? Where it's quite astounding to me that, that a film like that, where basically we're talking about the British Indian Army that is fighting a war. So, but yet it, that the fact that it's actually a colonial period and that those soldiers were actually fighting on the behalf of the British Empire somehow conveniently, conveniently gets telescoped into that there's a fight for the nation, the Indian nation. And to me, that was a very bizarre and very disturbing um, presentation of the past, right? So I feel like that's, and, and I think many of us uh, scholars of cinema, but also I think viewers of cinema um, of a certain generation who grew up with a very different perspective uh, that was being portrayed about the Indian nation, which was a more pluralist idea of the nation, a certain idea of secularism um, that was there in mainstream Hindi cinema. Um, I'm not saying that it isn't there, completely, but I feel like that's something that definitely has shifted that we're uh, with certain kind, whether it's a Stanhaji or um, even, you know, something like Padmava, uh, you know, there's a lot of films that have been made in the recent past, where a very particular idea of the past, a very particular Hindu idea of the past that's being put forward, a Hindutva idea of the past that's being put forward in the mainstream. Um, and I would say as a viewer, I find it actually both bizarre and disconcerting. Um, and, you know, cinema, I mean, any kind of uh, popular art form is a product of its times, it's a product of its context. And I, it's not surprising given the way the country itself and the kind of the larger political uh, context, the larger social context that, you know, that India is in at this time, it's not surprising that these types of narratives are um, being made or, you know, and coming to the screen and are, are circulating. It's, it's, you know, every, every art form, you know, is a product of its times. And we live in these kind of particularly polarized, um, national, you know, kind of Hindutva times. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. Or yeah, maybe I've opened up a can of worms and I will, and, you know, and maybe get trolled for some of these points. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, you were for a very short time associated with filmmaking while you were in India, and it was post liberalization of mm -hmm. 1990s. So, do you think, as a, as an effect or side effect of liberalization, the filmmakers started pitching the movies to very NRI associated movies like the like the uh, like the uh, Karan Johar's movies mm -hmm. of early 2000s? where they show lavish lifestyle and sure. and and uh, you know nris and the foreign uh, shootings sure. do you think this was also a side effect of the liberalization because earlier in 70s we have movies like pura Pashim, which were shot uh, you know abroad but it was not that much uh, that we see after liberalization so do you sure. see it as an yeah. effect yeah, I, yeah, I've actually, I wrote extensively about this period in my book, Producing Bollywood. I mean, I think we have to be careful. There is a way that, and I, that you know, I am part of the NRI audience, um, that NRI uh, diasporic audiences started to be blamed by the Indian press for like everything that went wrong with, um, you know, Hindi cinema in the 2000s. So it's, you know, this basically this idea that, you know, filmmakers are only making films for the overseas market. And I want to say that um, filmmaking is net, you know, is a mix of a lot of uncertainty and you know a lot of shoot you know kind of shots in the dark and when things work then people have this like hindsight analysis that oh this worked and hence right so like sometimes the analysis itself is problematic um but having said that well definitely the overseas markets became important in the sense that filmmakers were able to actually recoup revenues from them because of certain kinds of changes in distribution arrangements prior to kind of prior to the late 90s or prior to really the early 2000s, like filmmakers would just sell their overseas rights and had no idea how the film did and they hadn't, didn't have any way of actually getting those revenues. Once they were able to actually start getting revenues back because either they partnered 
with or opened up their own distribution concerns, then of course the overseas market then became yet another market to kind of think about. Um, and, and, and I think what's interesting, and I think, um, I think definitely, I think what the, you know, what the diasporic context allowed for is for certain filmmakers to be able to kind of indulge their own particular aesthetic choices in a way that, you know, like, so, I mean, the diaspora, because it's like it was set abroad, like enable them to kind of indulge them, um, it, that would seem to be aligned with the narrative. So if you set something abroad, it would actually make it more logical. Well, you shot abroad, right? You know, so you could have those like fantastic locations. I mean, there were still plenty of films where it was set in India and then they were still shooting, you know, going off and doing those, you know, wonderful song sequences all over the world. But it offered some filmmakers some kind of idea of like plausibility. Like if we just set it abroad, then we can just like shoot it abroad. We can have, you know, we can have these like lavish, we can still portray this fantasy. I mean, if you think about it, Hindi films have always shown lavish wealth. If you think about some, like even if a film like Avara, which is, you know, about the differences, but you know, if you see Judge Jagunath's home, it's this lavish home, right? Um, you fast forward decades and you think about like some of Karan Johar's like films. I mean, you see these lavish homes, they just like happen to be set in New York or happen to be set in London. But like, you know, so that the, 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 portrayal of luxury has always been there in Hindi cinema. It's just that like, what is the, like what kind of role did it occupy in the narrative shifted in the nineties, suddenly like that's all there was, right? So we see only these wealthy families. Um, and it wasn't just of course set, it wasn't always just NRIs, right? It was also people who had some kind of connection, you know, so in something like Kabi Kushi Kabi Gam, it's like both India and, and the UK. Um, and I think, but also I think what happens is that despite how fantastic they appear, these films in terms of their look, there is something more sophisticated, both, both um, I guess, uh, simplistic and yet sophisticated at the same time. Like Purva Pashtim, that kind of binary opposition, East and West, and like that stark morality, moral, morality kind of moral play that morality play that was showing, if you look at it is actually a really simplistic idea of what happens with immigrate immigration. Whereas at least in like, you know, in the films later in the like the late 90s and early 2000s, um, I think this notion of Indianness is simplistic in one sense, but yet complicated. The idea that, you know, you could be in the UK, you could be in the US and you could be Australia and you could still kind of hang on to your sense of uh, cultural identity and that you were like invested in your uh, Indian identity is actually more realistic because most of the times, I mean, I grew up in the US and you know, being part of the diaspora, often immigrants and their, and their communities are much more nostalgic and they're much more invested in hanging on to some sense of cultural identity, right? So in that sense, those films, despite how, you know, completely fantastic they seemed at times, I think they got it in essence that was there that like some of the older films that portray this binary opposition didn't if that if that like makes sense yeah so those who wish to interact with professor can uh, use the raise hand option on zoom and i'll unmute uh, the participants uh, meanwhile diverting a bit from the topic of regulation uh, you have been uh, involved in dubbing of sa sacred games and the brief a season one in English and seeing the rise of OTT platforms in the recent past and the push that it has received due to the coronavirus pandemic when the cinema halls were closed and people had to buy Hotstar or, or something to watch the premieres of uh, Bollywood movies. Yeah. How do you see the future of Hindi cinema apart from the cinema halls like the, sure. uh, the you know, the, the, what you can say is how we used to perceive cinema, like we had to go to the cinema halls to watch it. Now we can see it easily on our phones. How do you see this change and how it will affect the cinema industry? Yeah, that's what, that's the question everybody's asking. I just wanted, I noticed that two people have raised their hands. So I don't know whether, um, I, three people have raised their hands. So should we, or maybe you can get, um, you can note that down. Let me quickly answer this question about OT. This is a question, this is a million dollar question that no one has a perfect answer to. What the one thing that I do wanna say that I have been thinking about is that this switch to OTT because of you know necessity 
um, you know, there's a lot of discussion. I've been following all these discussions like within the industry kind of, you know, uh, as, as much as I can sitting here. Actually, sometimes now it's become easier because everything is on Zoom. Um, but is that um, this uh, anxiety about like, will people return to the theaters? But then also there's this like, there is also this great hope that maybe by watching all of this, you know, all of this content on OTT, people's tastes will improve. So back to those older discourses that I've been following forever, which is that, you know, Indian audiences, somehow their taste is what's holding us back. So like audiences will improve in their taste and they will demand better filmmaking. So there's a hope that a lot of filmmakers keep, keep I keep hearing that in these discussions. But to me, what I'm most fascinated by is in an industry which is so uh, pegged to stardom and the economics in the industry, right? Where before the pandemic, even today, nearly 70% of industry revenues come from domestic theatrical box office, right? So it is an industry that depends on theater going. How do you, how, what will happen when, when you see something on an OTT platform, how do we know if it's a hit or a flop? OTT platforms do not, are notorious for not releasing any numbers, right? They keep all of those, you know, like viewing, they have, they all talk, but they have lots of data that apparently they all know exactly what we watch and how much we watch and how we watch, but they don't actually release the, that data. So you don't know if something is a hit or a flop when it's on an OTT platform. And, and if for an industry that's oriented around hits, how, you know, what is that going to do? Like, and also this notion of stardom, like how, you know, what, how, how will stardom be reconfigured, right? If we don't understand, if we, so our ideas of success has to have to be recalibrated. So there's, there can be this tremendous kind of reconfiguration that can happen, which I'm very curious about, right? So that, you know, so, I mean, obviously like the story, as they say, picture be baki right? So like, we don't know what's happening, um, but I just want to, you know, I want to get to, I see that there are, um, yeah. Why don't you get to the hand? Uh, I'll, I'll now unmute uh, Chani Jaswal. Chani, you can ask a question. Hi, Chani. Greetings, ma'am. It's a privilege to be able to talk to you directly. Um, I'm sure that the I, I, to I, the Indian I, film industry. Sorry, I, you're cutting uh, out. Yeah. I couldn't hear. Could I think you, it's the internet. Can you, can you uh, type it in the chat, the question? No. I think I received a question. It is, oh, how did the colonial government react to the development of the Indian film industry? Were they dismissive of it or insecure of the cinema? Um, well, so yeah, that's a great question. So one, we have to remember there was no such thing as like one film industry, right? Um, the way the British government, the colonial government like saw cinema is in a few ways, right? One is they start censorship. One, because as I mentioned, in the silent era, the main films that were coming in were from the US and the British felt that like, that was actually competent, you know, the British wanted their films to be able to circulate in India, but the American films were edging them out, um, which was, so that was a source of uh, concern for them. And also the reason censorship starts is because you have all these kind of fantastic, you know, popular like, um, titillating American films or you know it's like about like uh, it's like crime films and westerns what have you and like where you show like all these white people who are doing all kinds of things that are seen as uh, either immoral basically the British were concerned about the reputation of white people and white civilization right and that they felt that American films were damaging the kind of civilizational superiority that the British put forth as their reason for colonizing India, right? It's like, you know, well, we, you know, we are like morally, culturally, civilizationally superior. And these American films that were showing, you know, crime and all kinds of other things were like um, kind of debasing that, right? So that's one of the reasons why censorship gets put into place is to really protect the image of what, you know, the white person, right? So, so that, so, so there's this moral panic 
that is engendered by the circulation of these American films. So, so that's censorship. And then of course, taxation and then the licensing of theaters, right? So it's really, um, it's like, again, and that's connected to censorship. So, so they, they, and the other dimension than when filmmaking really takes off in like local languages is also a way to censor any kind of like uh, signs of nationalist struggles, right? So um, any kind of film that seemed to like, um, make a case for Indian independence, no matter how obliquely, well, that's how then filmmakers became much more creative as to try to somehow put forth like messages of rebellion and revolution in their films by putting it, setting it in the past or, you know, doing all kinds of other interesting ways to get around, right? So, so the British were anxious mainly from the point of view of like, what's this gonna do to our um, image and our ability to kind of control India? Um, and also you have to remember that, you know, British colonialism was also based on a lot of indirect rules. So there was a lot of other, you know, so you, so you have a lot of economic enterprise that is like deeply entwined with the colonial project, right? And who are, and so it's a lot of Indians who are also benefiting from the colonial project, right? So it, you can't say this one kind of one simple thing that like the British saw like, oh, it, filmmaking was developing and this is a threat to it. The threat was not seen so much as an economic threat as more as a kind of a political and cultural threat. Does that answer your question? Hopefully. Uh, next question is from Suresh Chauhan. Suresh, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, hello. Uh, Hi. Can I see you or is it, or do you have a problem with your... Oops. So this you can unmute. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. Hello. Hi. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your lecture. It was uh, really good. Uh, so the question I wanted to ask, uh, you talked about the relationship of cinema and the Indian state. So can you uh, talk about the relationship of the uh, relationship of the Indian state on the one hand and the tele television industry per se on the other? Uh, okay. if, were there, uh, do you see any differences between, you know, the, this, uh, the, the relation in the relation with cinema and the television? Right. So, so. Sure, uh, sure, of course. Thank you. That's a huge question, and there's lots of scholars who've written a lot about a television. But quickly, I mean, the diff the big difference, right, between the development of cinema and the development of television, is that the development of television was initiated by the state, right? It was initiated in the 50s by the Indian government, and it was like explicitly done for the point of view of development and modernization, right? Um, whereas cinema kind of emerges completely as a private sector activity, right? So, um, and it, it emerges earlier, but so, so from, the in, from the outset, television was seen as a state kind of, uh, kind of to that attitude of like, okay, media, audiovisual media can be this important tool for uh, development, right? And modernization. So television had that as its kind of basic ideology behind it from the state's point of view. And in terms of like in the 1950s, the first, um, the first kind of experiments with very, like a very short uh, um, kind of area that, you know, like there was telecast. And, and if you realize it's not until like, the until the night until liberalization that you have this like explosion in the television landscape right um and then of course and television has been regulated much more uh, for a long i mean in terms of like content wise and all of that you know um and of course and the, and it's a huge arena of um of uh of kind of scholarship and, and, and I'm not a television scholar, but like, I would say the big difference is that like, you know, the fact that film film develops in a completely kind of unregulated, well, it's not unregulated, but like it develops in the private, kind of in the private sector and television doesn't start in the private sector, right? So so their, their kind of origin points are like very different if that, if that helps. Uh, next question is from Chinmay Kumar. Chinmay, you can unmute yourself now. Hello. Uh, can you see me, uh, hear me? Yeah, I can. Am I clear? 
Yeah. Yes. Uh, good evening to everybody from India, and especially good morning, ma'am. Uh, you talked about uh, that the government was uh, so late to recognize even in film as an industry in India. In fact, it has to do a lot more so far as the film industry is concerned. But uh, if we'll see the uh, last decade or the particularly mm -hmm. the first uh, last election of Indian politics, now the government uh, is using a film industry to uh, uh, spread its political motive, uh, propaganda, vendetta, what you can say. Mm -hmm. And you can get, take the examples like the accidental prime minister, biopic of Mr. Modi. Mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. if I'll say about my state Odisha, last election uh, Odisha government also invoked uh, the legendary Bizu Patnaik in a mm. commercial movie. So how do you see the relationship between political parties with film industries? And uh, don't you see that the uh, political parties are now trying to uh, capture the psyche and the psychology of uh, the Indian common peop people uh, from the uh, ranging from the making of the films to the its receptions by the pe people? Well, actually, there's a well, thank you. It's a great question. And there's a much longer history than what you mentioned. I mean, if you look at southern India, look at the look at Tamil Nadu, right? Um, and the state of Tamil Nadu in terms of like, if you look at the history of its political, of its politics, post independence and political parties, and, and it's, uh, you know, people who've been the chief ministers, I mean, the, the relationship between filmmaking and uh, political parties and mobilization are deeply, deeply intertwined in Tamil Nadu. And then also to some extent, later you see that also in Andhra Pradesh, right? I mean, when you have chief ministers like N.T. Ramarao or, um, you know, you have uh, MGR in, in Tamil Nadu and then Jay Lalita, right? So that relationship between filmmaking and kind of formal politics has been there um, and has been very tight for quite some time in India. Um, in the other languages because, because in terms of the way, um, if you think about kind of film markets and like, and what, you know, the audience space also kind of being uh, the electoral base, right? There's like, you know, you see a lot of correspondence between that had been less so in the Hindi case because of Hindi being distributed nationally. And so there's no one base right, for, for Hindi cinema, although you had those moments in the 80s when Amitabh Bachchan won, he was an MP, right, from Uttar Pradesh, so like he also won election, but you know, didn't obviously, that didn't um, bode really well for him. Um, so I feel like, you know, the, the kind of dimension, I mean, in that sense, like film, the potential for film as a me medium of communication and hence also a medium of propaganda, that is also, I mean, that there's a long history to that, um, right? In the world, um, the Nazis were really very effective in using film for their mobilization. So that dimension, I feel like, has always been there. Um, I think in the Indian context, I think part of the frustration that, you know, vis a vis the Hindi film industry that I was kind of outlining is that. Um, I think national leaders weren't able to capture that potential. Now we're seeing that potential much more as with the examples that you're, you're um, bringing to fore. And that's the thing to kind of, I think, um, I mean, I find that's troubling, but also it's interesting to kind of think through like, that's a different, so that's a question about like, what is happening in this moment that enables that kind of capture of the kind of filmmaking apparatus on the part of political parties that that's effective compared to like an earlier time when it wasn't right I mean so that so and I think it also has to do with like the people who are entering the filmmaking um, sphere um, I think we're seeing different kinds of demographics of people entering filmmaking um, compared to the past um, so yeah, but but I wanted to remind us that you know, like if you look in the history of like southern states, I mean, you know, that relationship has been is very long-standing and has been very powerful, and lots has been written about about the relationship between politics and cinema uh, in India in that way, formal politics and cinema in India. I just can also use the feature of raise hand to ask the question, uh, ma'am. You you mentioned uh, about the OTT platform earlier, and mm -hmm. now very recently, I think last week we got the news that the government is going to regulate the OTT right, platforms yeah. now. So that means the censor board is going to play their role now. A increasing role of censorship will be seen in the uh, different web series and 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 shows. So how do you see this change? Uh, 
in in ott platforms what will it do are you asking me what you think well I, you know i i i haven't read the full um the full like kind of the you know like in terms of the the text of the of the regulation i know that it's come through um and i mean in one sense like i i don't know how the how how it's going to be um what the modality of implementation is do you do you know like how they're planning to do that like that's the that's the part i have to like look into i mean um if it's going to be a similar way that film gets censored or is it going to be um some other mode does anyone actually hear on the on the call know like what the exact execution or implementation of it's going to be does anyone know i'm just looking in the chat because it just happened right so i haven't had a chance to yeah like, yeah um so I, so if we put aside the implementation like how it's the modality of how it's actually going to be worked out but you're asking me what you think the impact of like censor censoring will be of ott yeah um well i mean i think filmmakers are not going to be happy that's for sure i mean the ott platforms have enabled a certain um i mean you know filmmakers definitely feel free right to be able to kind of realize their creative visions in ways that they feel that they're not able to with theatrical releases now some people may say like oh they've gone too far other you know uh, you know that i mean i feel like that's uh you know and that's a that's been a, a discussion which is why initially there was supposed to be some form of self-monitoring right that you know there was these discussions um to me I'm also not, I mean, I, I'm skeptical, like how well this can actually get implemented, but I don't know enough to see like what the, you know, but I think, um, yeah, the, the government is saying that they have to self monitor, self regulate. Yeah. 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 That, yeah, 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 that yeah. was absent. That, yeah. Yeah. And of course, but you know, um, so this is, this is part of what I'm saying is right. Like this ambivalence where, you know, the films of a certain era were the kinds that, you know, political leaders like, yeah, this is great. Uh, and now with the rise of not just OTT platform, but even before the rise of OTT platforms, you see like a new form of a new type of Hindi cinema that emerges in the kind of after like from like around 2010 onwards, within the last decade where things are not as nostalgic, you know, things are showing kind of the dysfunctionality of current political situations and um, current kind of social structures. And that again, makes, you know, people in power uncomfortable. And then of course the OTT platforms, I mean, the kinds of shows that are out there, they're really showing kind of like the underbelly of life of kind of contemporary life in India, whether it's urban or rural, that again makes people in power uncomfortable because it's not portraying that, you know, uh, wonderful, nostalgic, everything is great version of India to, to Indians or to the world, right? So I'm not surprised that, you know, um, government, you know, government leaders want to censor OTT uh, platforms. Um, yeah, it'll be, um, and, you know, and I remember when Sacred Games was, you know, airing and all of the, like, um, the, you know, the various FIRs that were filed against, you know, people involved with the series because of whether, you know, because of the portrayal of, of um, political leaders and the portrayal of the situation and not realizing, well, you know, this was, it was, it's based on a novel and so it's in the novel, right? Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I mean, the last many years we've seen this tremendous, like, you know, the heavy hand of uh, censorship across so many domains of cultural expression in India, not just in film, right? We see it in publishing, we see it all, all across. And, and unfortunately it's just a, a continuing, um, uh, it's just like a continuing manifestation of that. And I really hope that, uh, I mean, I, I honestly, I don't, I don't believe in censorship. So I really think, um, yeah, it's an it's an unfortunate um, uh, kind of an unfortunate occurrence, and I'll be I, I'll be obviously closely following to see like what how this plays out. Yeah. Yes. So to to end this uh, to to end this conversation, uh, I would I would ask you a question re relating to your recent research interest, that is the language of Hindi cinema, the dubbing of Hindi movies and uh, the web series to English and other mm -hmm. languages. Mm 
how do you see this growing and what is the impact of such activities to word over and to to the cinema itself um okay that that's a really huge question um is there well i think it's interesting well the i mean the thing that i my main focus has been is the dubbing of hollywood films into hindi um and that i have learned tremendously by by observing that process um and it has, has really helped me to kind of rethink how we think about uh various film industries how we think about the notion of um like kind of the idea of like na like a national you know like national industries because one of the things i've learned and i've noticed is like when hollywood gets dubbed into hindi all of the decision you know so like you know often you know the first the first way we may think oh my god hollywood's getting dubbed into hindi and what does that mean it's you know and you know we hear about like how avengers end game was like actually the most successful hindi film of 2019 right Avengers Endgame in Hindi broke all kinds of box office records and did way more business than a lot of Hindi films, right? So then people say, "Oh no, okay, that's it. The writing on the wall. There's doom for local film industries because Hollywood is here. It's the big 800 pound gorilla. It's a big game in town." What I discovered is that actually, but no, I mean that's actually not. It's much more complicated than that. It's not so straightforward. Um, all of the decisions, like. you know all of the decisions that um are made in terms of what films get dubbed happen in india by by the indian you know managers or executives of the hollywood studios all of the people who are doing all the work the dubbing you know directing the dubbing the voice the voice artists the writing all happens in india right the people who um the whole exhibition and distribution structure also indians right So from the point of view of a distributor whether it's Avengers or whether it's you know whatever uh what how, you know some other films like whether it's Avengers or I can't remember what some other films that came out last year like I don't know Tanhaji whatever it's like you know to, from the point of view of exhibitors and distributors it's money coming into the system right um and also one thing I noticed by doing the field work in the dubbing studio is that how much gets changed like when you're adapting a film into hindi you have to think about kind of local context i mean translation is this very complicated action that nothing ever gets just like is not a literal mapping from one language to the other right so much gets actually changed in translation both like because of the language but also having to adapt the context so in one sense you know can we even call the hindi version of avengers the same you know is it really the same film anymore right um so that's one of the and also the fact that um you have this really interesting i mean like my point is that the these industries kind of quote bollywood and hollywood like when you take dubbing into account those boundaries between these two industries start to get really blurred and get very fuzzy that's one thing you know i realize and the other thing is like because i've also looked at the other direction you know dubbing of indian content like from hindi to english that also becomes interesting because then it's suddenly like um how do we think about you know like how do we try to think about like garnering a global audience in a very specific way right so so in the sense what the ott platforms are enabling i mean hindi films and hindi media have had a global audience for decades like i would say like from the 50s onwards it's always been a global industry it's always been a global cinema um but what i think what dubbing is enabling is that you know allowing for this content to reach even newer audiences and newer markets right um and breaking down, again like crossing borders in a way which i think that you know filmmaking and uh, and media making can do you know uh i feel like we're in this moment where people are trying to enact borders what i really like and hope that's like media is able to break down those borders so i think i mean that's a really broad answer because there's like so many different dimensions to to what you asked but i hope that gives you some some indication of yeah. where i'm thinking with this yeah so thank you so much ma'am for taking out time from your busy schedule and for delivering this lecture and it is it is it is one of the i think most uh, interesting lectures for me personally because uh, i i love bollywood i love reading about it and i think it is no exception to any indian that they love bollywood movies 
so thank you so much ma'am and thank you so much everybody who joined us live on facebook and through zoom and who asked the questions and we hope to have ma'am again after the release of her next book on dubbing and those who wish to interact with ma'am can can uh, raise their hands so i'll unmute them and they can have a conversation